that thing. And the other event was Casablanca. I saw Casablanca. And I had a little uh, Turkish friend there who uh, was watching with me. And um, I just figured, wow, everything about uh, 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 Russell and um, um, Ingrid Bergman, Isabel Russell, uh, Ingrid Bergman was just so elegant and gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I, I said to my yes. mom, uh, I, I, when, when I grow up, I want to do what she does. And I didn't even know acting existed, but it was clear. And my parents were so supportive. Oh. And I happened to be in a Montessori school. My teacher was an actress at night. Huh. So we would go and see all her performances. And they were very sophisticated, like, uh, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre, very existential plays that I didn't huh. understand. But I was fascinated. I was hooked. Um, and and then in school, you know, after school, we we started doing theater and 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 very early on, when I was how old was I? Eleven. There was a crew, a TV crew, came to uh, school and uh, were looking for a class to film this uh, about bullying, a story about bullying, huh. and they they chose the class next to us. And I literally ran over to the film crew and I talked them out of it. I said, no, no, our class is much better. We have this fat kid. I can, you know, bully him. And I was the bully and the fat kid was the one who was being bullied. <laughs> and how old were you then? Um, I am um, like 11, I would say 11, 12. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. That is such a great story. Um, and, and where did you grow up exactly? In, Ger in Germany, in Cologne. In Cologne. Cologne. Okay. I think of you as, as a French speaker. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, when I, when I went to live in France and, and you really learned how to speak French other than high school French, mm -hmm. um, and uh, started to work with the Théâtre du Soleil. Um, I was only there for two and a half years, but I still sometimes dream in French. Oh and my gosh. yeah, it, on the way here, because uh, I had an interview this morning in, in another town, so I had to drive 45 minutes. On the way back, I was listening to French music and I thought, it's, it's so weird. I feel so French. And wow. in my DNA, there's, there's French. I, I did find uh, through the 23 in me, I found out that I have French heritage. Yeah. Really? Oh, that's so interesting. When I lived in Spain for a year, and I remember being really surprised that I started a dream in in Spanish. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I and I'd be like, wow, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's amazing that you you were born in Germany. So you got to tell me about the Théâtre du Soleil. I I've heard about them, read about them. Can you tell us a little bit about working in that company? Yeah, I mean, it was extraordinary. The first time I heard uh, or, or saw something about the Théâtre du Soleil was when I was in drama school. I was 19 mm. uh, in Hamburg. And me and my friend Oliver uh, Brumis, who's still my best friend, um, he had this big book of Mephisto. And it was a play by this French theater company, Théâtre du Soleil. And um, it was fascinating. I, I used to look through this book and think, oh my God, it would be so amazing to be part of this company. Cut to um, New York City um, in the 90s, where I was studying with Susan Batson. And one of the actresses was uh, Valeria Bruni Tedeschi. She is uh, Italian French. She uh, became a huge movie star um, after after that time, and um, her her, um, her sister is Carla Bruni, the uh, model, singer, and and wife of the ex president, etc. Anyway, big big family. She said to me after uh, she saw me doing uh, Agnes of God by John Pilmeyer, playing this nun um, at the actor's studio. She said, "You know, Nicole." 
you're the kind of actress that Ariane Mushkin really likes. I think you should go to Paris and, and work with her. And I thought, Ariane Mushkin, I've heard that name before. I've never seen the play. Anyway, cut to a year later, I, uh, uh, my German friend who got married to a fashion designer. I mean, this is, this is a loopy story, but this is a little bit how my life goes. I just follow <laughs> you know, the, the trail lead. So my friend calls me and says, I'm so bored, I'm, I'm pregnant, come, you know, come and visit me in Paris. I now live in Paris, you know, we, we were high school friends and um, model, you know, big belly. And it was, um, uh, it was fascinating. She was living really the high life. She was living in this townhouse with a garden, with a cook, with a chauffeur. And, you know, uh, I mean, Naomi Campbell went in and out and it was like very fancy and, you know, me, art, artist me like going, wow, okay. We're sitting at lunch and all of a sudden I go, I have to call the Théâtre du Soleil. And she goes, yeah, you can do that after lunch. I said, no, 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 I have to do it now. So I went to the telephone, got the operator to connect me. And I went, guess who that? And, you know, what are you doing? And they went, guess who that? I said, no, guess who that? No, guess who that? And this went on. And then they went, are you an actress? And I said, we. Oui. And they said, are you calling for the audition, for the interview? I said, we. Oui. <laughs> So what happened is um, what they do is they do an interview process. Like there were over 2000 people coming, you know, on a, over a period of two weeks from all over the world, literally from Africa, from America, from England, from Germany, from everywhere, Brazil, Argentina. And you have this, this, this eclectic group of people um, outside in the Bois de Boulogne, you know, outside of Paris, is this theater complex, uh, different theaters, but the Théâtre Soleil is the most known. Mm -hmm. And um, you have an interview. So I went to the interview, I had my letter, like I'm invited, right? And the guy who interviewed me spoke so fast. And I did not understand what he said. And I was just sitting there going, okay, okay. And the, he said, with the lettre? Uh, la lettre, oui. <laughs> and basically what he said to me, show me the letter, like your, your invitation. And I didn't show him the letter. So after a while he said, he literally like uh, let it rip. He said, how do you expect me to, uh, to interview or, or for you to enter this, this theater company if you don't even speak French, if you don't even understand me? And, I went, here's the letter, idiot. And the idiot just came out and was like, oh God, you cold, seriously. And he looked at me like, hmm, okay. Looked at the letter. And then I had to give him a, a, a recipe for food, like something that I can cook. And I was like, I really don't want to cook. Like I want to act. But the way that the company works is that that actors do everything. Like one day you might cook, the other uh -huh. day you might sew the costumes. Uh -huh. You know, it's very very egalitarian, yeah. and they want to find people who are of that ilk, who really feel like want to live in a community, who want to live uh -huh. that life. And uh -huh. I gave him a really boring recipe because I wasn't <laughs> macrobiotic at the time. <laughs> And I could see him going, oh, I'm never going to eat that. And then I got invited to, to a workshop. No, to like an audition for the workshop. That went on. And it, it was terrible. Like everybody was terrible that day. And at the end of the day, she, and it was all improvisation. And at the end of the day, she said, this was the most terrible day of my life. I've seen so little talent here. Does anybody have anything to do? And, you know, people literally went and did tap dancing and juggling and anything to grab her attention. Oh. I figured, I figured, you know, this is my chance. She's world famous. Um, 
So I just went and did um, a private moment, which is a very uh, method actory actor studio thing, the private moment of the character. Mm-hmm. And my setup was I'm sleeping and it was all with music. You had to choose the music. So I, I used uh, Holt's Four Seasons and um, it starts very low and then it goes very dramatic. So I started sleeping, then wake up from a nightmare and then I cook my breakfast. Hmm. And here's the fourth wall, right? And I'm, I'm getting up, you know, I'm in it, I'm cooking my breakfast. I look up to the fourth wall and who is there? Ariane Mushkin with her white hair looking like Albert Einstein, you know. And I froze, I literally like froze. And she said, stop, what happened here, Nicole? You were in it, I could feel you, you were with the music, the rhythm was right. And then all of a sudden you stopped and I went, oh God, shall I tell her the truth? And I, I went like, okay, I'll just tell her the truth. I said, you know, I was in it. And then I saw you and I went, how stupid? You're cooking an egg. Like what, what a stupid idea is that? This is Ariane. She's one of the greatest theater makers ever. And, and this is pointless what you're doing here. This is so idiotic. And um, I sat down and I started to cry. And we were about 200 people at, uh, on that day. And she just went through the list. Okay, da, 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 Nicole. And there was another Nicole. And I thought she meant her. And everybody went, Nicole, Nicole, you're in, you're in. And I was like, no, the other Nicole, no, you, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and this process started. And every week she would go, you stay, you go, you stay, you go, you stay, you go every week and this went on for three months and after three months i was still in and she we ended up with eight people who actually i didn't even know this was an audition to enter the company you know Uh i was my french was so bad i i literally was just holding on to a thread trying to figure out what people were talking about Mm-hmm. And we had a confrontation at one point, actually. Um, sorry if this is getting a little bit long. I'm, I'm loving it, but... Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> we actually had, at one point, um, I did this very long improvisation in which I played, I played this young ingenue lover who finds this letter by her lover which is, which is a tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night, the, the, the Blake uh, poem. Um, and uh, probably the only poem I know by heart, <laughs> you know. Um, and while she is reading it, she turns into the tiger because she realizes that he left her. So that was my story, right? And this is a long improvisation. Then he comes with, a, you know, with fanfare and, and uh, after that, she started to talk to me and, and it, it was very engaging, but I couldn't understand her. She was quoting Rambo, she was quoting Molière, she was talking about Maribo and, and she could, you know, and I was just trying to read her lips and whatever motivated her. And she said, you know, sometimes Nicole, I look at you and I think she doesn't understand me. She doesn't even speak French. <laughs> and I said, well, in truth, Madame Nushkin, my French is a little limited. And she went, no. So you are telling me that you've been here for two and a half months and that <laughs> your French is actually not that good. And I went, yes. Which, of course, in her world was ideal because she's very uh-huh. unconventional. Uh-huh. She likes people with accents. She likes people of different cultures. Uh, very, very different from 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 the um, from the mainstream theater world, where it's all like, oh, I think she has a bit of an accent. No, she can't be from here. You know, it's mm-hmm. the opposite. Mm. So, so and and then I was there for two and a half years. We toured, and it was an amazing, wow. amazing experience. Amazing. I don't know if most Americans know uh, the reputation of Théâtre du Soleil, um, but what I it, is is all the work that they do experimental. Would you say that it's in a, an avant-garde kind of mode? 
I actually wouldn't call it avant-garde. No, because okay. Ariane makes theater for the people. Aha, uh -huh, um, right. Okay. She is very adamant about not having that elite sense of uh -huh. avant-garde that uh -huh. we see with Ivo van Hove. It's not that kind of avant-garde. Uh -huh, right. It is. It is more for the people. Yes. Um, very engaging, oftentimes involving the audience. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say it's avant-garde. She frequently comes to BAM and to the Brooklyn Academy of Music um, or to the Armory in New York City. These are the venues that, that like whenever her company comes, like the theater knowers and, and yes. lovers, they yes. know she's in town, yes. you know. Yes. Um, it yeah. reminds me, I, I uh, don't think about this too much, but I spent a summer with Bread and Puppet uh, Theatre in yeah. uh, So when you talk about living in community, uh, you know, I remember working in the wood shop and, you know, having, having an electric drill and just thinking this was like the best thing. <laughs> And then you know, I think of the costumes and performing and and cooking together and you know and and then uh, Peter makes bread uh, at the performances. Yes. So and he makes bread for the thousands of people that come. Um, so there's that. It sounds as if they maybe as if Anushka comes from a similar kind of philosophy about theater. Absolutely. I I met him actually, Peter. Okay. Um, and um, I was doing summer stock nearby in Vermont. Uh -huh. And of course I had to go and see the Bren Puppet. And Bren Puppet, yes. It's it's like the small scale version of, of uh, Nushkin, definitely. definitely. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I, I still have some posters that I keep up just to sort of keep a connection with my experience there. It was, it was an incredible experience to be there. Wow. Yeah. It's great. So it's great. I, I, um, I sort of want to hear how your acting career progressed, but I also keep going back to that 11 year old who went to the television crew and said, no, 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 you don't want to go to that class. You want to come to my class um, because that's the producer. Right. Oh, totally. totally. That, that's the producer, you know, speaking up at 11 years old, because maybe you wanted to act, but you know, you're you are creating that scenario for yourself. I I years ago I was working. I, I did this um, video program in a school for kids that were had all been um, thrown out of their schools. This was kind of the last house on the block, and we were making some um, PSAs. And uh, we went one Saturday to shoot at the school. And when we got there, they wouldn't let us in. And the kids all come to me and they're like, oh, Miss Butcher, Miss Butcher, they won't let us shoot today. They won't let us in the school. And I said, OK, now watch this. So I put on a pair of sunglasses and I put on my high heels and I strode across the street to the caretaker and just said, announced that we had to be allowed into that day because we've been given permission. And we all got in and I said to them, that's being a producer. <laughs> Oh my God, I love it. <laughs> Sunglasses, heels. Yeah. Dude, you know. <laughs> but you yeah. were doing that at 11. That's yes, great. I mean, I wish I had the confidence today that I had at that, as that 11 year old. I think what, what happens in this business is, you know, you start to do something and then you get the rejections and all of a sudden you go, it chips away on your um, on on what you know and what you want to do, and you know those of us who stay long enough who have the resilience. But you really need you need very thin skin because and you need transparency as the artist, but as the creator and as a producer as a director, you also need that thick skin, mm. and you need that as an actress as well in order to not let things you know get you down but continue wow that's so, really, really interesting so how did you after Teatro de Soleil how did you move forward in your acting and producing career did you move forward with the acting and the producing came later or did you keep doing both of them 
along the way? Now, uh, the producing um, uh, and directing started uh, much later. Uh, oh, what's, in okay. what's interesting though, that like I kept doing movies, TV, I moved from, um, from Germany to Switzerland, from Switzerland to New York to study with uh, Susan, with Uta Hagen, um, uh, working at the Actors Studio, going back, ending up at the Soleil. Then after France, I ended up um, uh, uh, guest starring in, uh, in Vienna. Um, and then was a staple guest star at, at the public theater there, started to do movies there. And um, after that period, I think that's when it started. I, um, I went to New York, I met my husband, I ended up in London. And what happened in London is um, all my work and everything stopped. I was lucky that I had um, a recurring role in a TV show in Germany. So once a month I would fly over for a few days to film. But other than that, I couldn't get an agent. I couldn't get arrested. Um, <laughs> because in England, it's where did you go to school? And what is that accent? Or, you know, like, uh, who do you know? And, um, but, but a lot of it is where did you go to school? Like they didn't know what to do with me. I didn't fit any of their boxes. Mm. So, um, so I, I I felt very desperate in London, and I wrote a, um, a short film, and I produced it, and I directed it, uh, called Tina Goes to Town, and it literally was just I, I wanted to create work for me. But the moment I was in the director's seat, I was like. Oh, it's a shame. It's a shame that I have to be in front of the camera. It's so much more fun. Um, and I tell you, last year in September, I I was in Germany. My mom gave me like a whole box of things and said, you know, this has been here. Like there's a bunch of stuff here. It was all um, diaries and notebooks. And I found this big book um, that said Regie Buch which means director's book. Huh. And it had short stories, scenes, ideas, huh. layouts. It was incredible and I forgot about it. And huh. I wrote this at age 18. Wow. So at 18, when I was in drama school, I already knew that I wanted to direct and I forgot about it. Uh -huh. So, um, so this is this is how how it started to happen, and I realized that I'm really good at bringing people together. Like mm -hmm. it was overnight that I was able to bring people together for this short film. Mm -hmm. Then something in Paris, I helped put together a short film that um, Valeria was in, Valeria Brunet Tedeschi, and Corinne Blue uh, directed it, and um, th th that was just natural for me. And um, I ended up uh, uh, back in the States. Let me just think. Yeah, I was back in the States. And um, that's when As Good As Dead, um, the thriller, um, uh, came to me um, through Eve Pomerantz and, and Jonathan Mossack. And um, I co helped co-produce that film. And it's a feature film um, with... Um, Annie McDowell and Gary Elvis. My husband is in it. He has a cameo in it. Um, uh, Brian Cox. And um, it. Th this is how the producing started. So it was all very natural. It just started to, uh, you know, started to happen like this. What was your role on that film? Uh, what you know, the title co-produced. So people often ask, you know, well, what does what does that mean to be a co-producer? What were your What was your role as a co-producer? Well, I mean, um, in fairness, uh, uh, I got I got my husband on board to uh -huh. to do this movie, right? right. Which got um, which got uh, um, uh, what's her name um, on board? Uh, I just said her name. Andy McDowell. Andy McDowell on board because she really wanted to work with him. And then I worked closely with Eve and with Jonathan, you know, um, getting it together. Um, uh, I did uh, not have the knowledge to really um, 
you know, I, I didn't have any knowledge of what a producer does. So I, I learned by doing on, uh, uh, on this film. And I have to say um, that, that it was an excruciating experience and I didn't ever want to produce again after oh, that movie. I was oh, like, oh, no, oh, this, oh, is, no. this is horrible. This is horrible. Oh my gosh. We had, we had one investor, um, uh, one producer who um, ran away with some money. I mean, oh. it was very scammy, the whole thing. Yeah, um, yeah. And made me, I, like I felt aged. I felt like I aged 10 years in one year. Wow. And I figured, you know, if I ever do that again, like I have to, I have to earn a lot of money because otherwise that makes no sense. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. But, you know, I mean, I'm sorry that that happened and it's so common because in a way, sometimes um, those bad experiences end up being like, okay, well, that's never going to happen again. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> like lesson. Yeah. It's it's nice if you can get the lesson in a pleasant way, but it's just not going to be that way always, you know. Yeah. Um, but that role that you played there of bringing cast is so great. And I, I, I have a, a client right now who uh, called me up one day and he was all like in a huff and he was like, well, I got this actress and she wants to play the role and she wants it to be offer only and then she wants to bring money in and she wants to get paid for that and get points on the back end. And I said, well, it all sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> Is she making it happen? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, yes. Okay. You know, so, um, and, and he, he had a fantastic experience working with her. And one of the things she did was bring other cast who were at her level and it's really, you know, up leveled the film because of that, you know, so, as a, um, uh, that, that to me seems one role for a producer or a co-producer that is fantastic and that, and what I see is that actors, no more actors, mm -hmm. you know, and, and can bring uh, those uh, uh, resources, it's a terrible word, but you know, resources to the table because you've had relationships with these people your entire career, you know, so. Yeah, the second one I uh, helped uh, uh, co-produce was uh, Blumenthal, um, a comedy. And um, on that one, I also got my husband involved um, and really good script, really uh, wonderful, wonderful script. And it, it was something he wanted to do. Um, mm -hmm. But on that film, I was there every single day. Mm -hmm. I was listening in, I was there for the talent. and and made sure that that I stay engaged and I, I, I stay involved. And I was able also to bring money to the table. Mm. So just, you know, literally just talking to people, networking and, and bringing money in. So um, that, yeah, that's, that's how. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, when, when this client uh, had this um, actor uh, do that, I just thought it was fantastic. And on her IMDb, she's got something like 20 feature films in between 2019 to now. And I realized she's doing wow. the same thing on every film, you know, mm -hmm. offering her services as an actor, her services to raise money and her services um, you know, therefore, as a producer, and and up leveling the quality of the film, and I just think is so smart. You yeah, know? a lot of actors um, uh, are doing it. I mean, you see it all the time uh, when you look at like great, like top A-listers, like Reese Witherspoon and and uh -huh. Brad Pitt and uh, yes. you know Matt Damon, and I mean, it's 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 incredible, Leo. Um, what because because it it does count if you have an a lister um uh, involved then everything else rolls in uh -huh. you know other actors want to be part of it and and you know you have somebody putting some money in it oh so and so put money in it i want to put money in it uh -huh. it's right. like the law of attraction <laughs> yes yes the law yeah. of movie attraction <laughs> yeah so, <laughs> so how long was it between those two experiences the one where you said i am never producing again and 
and when you jumped in again? Uh, it, it, it was pretty close to each other. But the oh. second one was uh, was a dear friend. We, uh, My husband and I did a play on Broadway called Rock and Roll by Tom Stoppard. And ah. um, I used to hang out a lot backstage because I only had four scenes, I think, in, in a very, very long play. Huh. And so um, wonderful scenes, but I had a lot of downtime. So in the downtime, the other actors, we usually hung out backstage, used to make coffee, talk. And uh, Seth Fisher was one of the actors who had a um, smaller part in this. And uh, he uh, came uh, to me with this, with, with this uh, uh, feature film that he wrote. And he did a fantastic short film before he came with that feature film. And um, he wrote a part for me in the, in the feature film as well. And, uh, and used stuff that he knew about me like, oh, you know, this is how you have to make the coffee. It has to be strong or else it's not coffee, you know, like, <laughs> which I used to say to him, you know, like what you Americans make is not coffee. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's painted water. <laughs> so. Wow, that's a great way to attract an actor to your project. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. Write, write a role for them and, and you know, and make it, that you are the only one who can play it. That, I mean, th those are the best. Uh, I mean, th those in a way are the best, not the best roles because it's interesting to play something else. But uh -huh. um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's all about relationships. And I think a lot of people who, who have this idea that like, I want to be part of the movie industry and it's all about there, you know, getting there. But no, it's about get being here and creating relationships and and but not with the afterthought of, oh, you never know, this person might become a super duper star. And that's why, yes, be nice to everybody. I mean, that's like was the first rule when I came to Hollywood when somebody told me be nice to everybody, you never know, you know. This person might direct you in a couple of years. So truth, but also be genuine and, 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 and just create relationships with the people that you, that you jive with. And yeah. that will be there for your life. Like if I look back, a lot of the things I have done is because I have created a relationship with those people and, um, you know, and they remembered me. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. So what do you think from the from the experience that was the experience where you said, I'm never producing again, what do you think the lessons were that you changed so that you could produce again? What were the what were the what were the boundaries that you said, OK, it's got to be this way now for me to do um, it again? everything in writing. Uh huh. I have a good lawyer <laughs> uh <-huh>. <laughs> <laughs> and, and no, um, stay with it all through the back end. Um, make sure that, that you follow how the progression of the movie, um, where it gets sold to like these things, you know, if you let that slip, uh -huh. you might be due some money but you never see the money if you don't, right? you know? So, so it's, for me, it's a lot of the financial stuff that I really didn't know how it works. Also distribution, like ideally you already have, you know, um, I mean, ideally you have distribution, but, but if, if you don't have it, at least, you know, um, start the ball rolling from the beginning and have like a quarter of the money that you spend for PR and, and for bringing the movie out. I think a lot of movies and really good movies, of course, in, we're talking independent movies here, suffer from, yeah, we have a great movie, but then they don't have the means to actually get it to the Academy, you know, in order, to be considered uh, for the Academy, you have to pump a ton of money 
into the campaign. So if you don't have money for the campaign, um, how how is anybody going to know that you have a fabulous movie? So um, don't spend all the money. That's that's I think one of the really <laughs> important things. You know, have enough money to properly pull up campaign. Yes. So recently you've been talking about a film that you've been in that you were very passionate about. Actually, now I can't remember. Were you in it or did you produce it? Um, but there's a film that you're very passionate about that you've been speaking about right now. What, what is that film? Um, uh, uh, the Civil Rights movie, Son of the South, maybe? Yes, yes. yes. How did you get involved in, in that film? Um, interesting. Um, I know the director, Barry Brown, Barry Alexander Brown. Mm. Uh, we've known each other. He was, <laughs> we know each other because a, yeah, because my husband uh, worked with Spike Lee and Barry is Spike Lee's number one editor um, mm. for most of his movies. And um, uh, so my husband became friends with Barry I became friends with Barry because Barry used to date somebody that we know from, <laughs> from, from Scotland and she's a good friend of mine. So um, Barry introduced me to Brooklyn. He literally said, oh, let's, let's meet and we'll meet at, at Junior's. And this is, you know, 10 years ago when I moved to Brooklyn. So I met at Junior's, had a cheesecake <laughs> uh, with Barry and um, uh, we had a great time. Anyway, um, cut to now three years ago, I would say, um, Eve Pomerantz, who uh, produced um, and, and wrote the movie As Good As Dead, she um, is also good friends with him. Did he also edit As Good As Dead a little bit? He edited something that, that she was involved with I, I i can't remember but basically um they've been working on on the civil rights movie son of the south which is an adaptation of bob zellner's the activist bob zellner's memoir um the wrong side of murder creek and um eve has been involved with this for 10 years trying to get the movie made with barry and she said you know you should consider um having a woman play the professor because there's not enough female roles mm -hmm. in here you know like why is the professor not female even mm -hmm. though it bends the reality and 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 she said and what if the professor was german <laughs> and perry was like why he said because i think me and nicole would be a great professor <laughs> so he's like i love her as a friend but i've never seen her act Oh. And and she's like, oh, she's playing Antigone uh, at the theater. Shall we go and see her? <laughs> so um, Barry and his wife, Veron, uh, they came to see me and he loved it. And um, and that's how it happened. And he said, oh, yeah, she's Professor Kleiner. And and he he let me actually contribute to um, uh, to the character because he wanted to bring he wanted to bring in uh, this warning sign from the professor uh, of trying to get Bob not to go out and 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 uh, join the civil rights, but also even talk to Rosa Parks and talk to Martin Luther King and talk to Abernathy. She didn't want him because she 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 claimed I've seen what the brown shirts have done. I've seen this. So she's come from Germany uh -huh. since the Holocaust. Right. Come to America, you know, and 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 as a professor of sociology, um, is trying to warn him. So he brought an element into the civil rights that 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 I think is really unique mm -hmm. that I haven't seen in any other civil rights movie. Just mm -hmm. with that, you know, with those couple of scenes that my mm -hmm. my character is in. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. The. Um... Uh, that is something that I see a lot, you know, with a script that um, there may be something that needs work, but it's sometimes such a, a small change that can make that huge difference. 
you know, and um, yeah, that's very interesting that so much could be could be brought in, you know, from so that, smart, those, so few smart. Scenes, those that that one character. But yeah, the character knowing I, I feel as though for me as a as an English person that, uh, you know, grew up with they were constantly finding um, unexploded World War Two bombs in London, for example. You know that that we have a connection as Europeans. We have a connection to the Second World War that I don't think Americans can really have because yeah. it was on their soil. And we just so yeah, that's really interesting to bring that um, that perspective in there. I really like that. So you're you're working on um, the distribution end of that film now, Son of the South. No, it's on, oh, uh, no. the South is out. Son of the South is available on VOD, you know, uh -huh. um, uh -huh. Apple TV, um, Amazon. It's 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 out. Um, you know, it skipped. It, it it was actually in 150 theaters uh, for a week or so um, to uh, you know to qualify for 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 consideration. Right. Which, um, uh, so it was considered, but unfortunately, it didn't get uh, partly because the money wasn't there to put into the campaign. Yes, yes. You know. This is what I remember you talking about on Clubhouse. You know, seeing that the film didn't have the budget to really make the push that it needed. But it also sounds as if it was very impacted by COVID. Very, of course. Oh, of course. I mean, I opening mean, in 150 theaters yeah. and poof. I mean, I didn't even go to the theater and I uh -huh. should have. Uh -huh. And and I, I felt bad that I didn't, but I was like, hmm, I don't want to risk it. it right. Was just at a time where, yeah. you know, COVID was so overwhelming, I, I, uh, I, I didn't take that trip. So I don't blame anybody who didn't. You know, go to the theater uh, for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, what do? Oh, here's a question I love to ask. So, if the perfect project came across your desk today, what would it be, and what would your roles be? Oh, goodness. <laughs> ah, the perfect project would have a very complex uh, character, but, but as an actress or as a director. Oh, but I didn't. I didn't specify. So oh, my it God. can be. It can be as perfect as you want it to be. <laughs> you know what? I would probably, um, you know, either it would be playing a very complex, amazing character in a feature film with a brilliant director. Blah. Yes. Yes. But as a director, um, I would probably have like a small little part in there mm. just to dip my toes in. Uh -huh. But right now I'm directing um, I'm uh, directing a play that we're actually creating. Um, it's called I Am Every Woman. And uh, we are starting the whole writing process on Zoom. And then we're going to be in person. Everybody's going to be vaccinated in uh, Chatham, New York at PS21. It's a performance space for the 21st century. It's called... Um, it is uh, a truly extraordinary uh, performance space. The Wooster Group is going to be there. So it's wow. very high end, gorgeous uh, stuff. And um, I am not yet sure if I'm going to be in it because I so have the view of, of the, the vision of what I want to see. Um, and one of the actresses also directs, I asked her if I end up putting myself in there as one of the women can you like co-direct this? Can you be there and direct me? Because um, so much has to do with rhythm and and stepping in or out is is not so easy as as most actor directors think. Like the idea of oh, I'm gonna write this, you know, this feature film and I'm gonna be the lead in it and whoa, okay, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> You know, because you, you need that I, you need that I, you need that person who can hold it all together and see everything together. And as the actor, it's the opposite. You have to have a strong uh, creation vision 
and trust with the director so that you can surrender and co-create that vision. But surrender and, and, you know, on a certain level, I think as a director, you do surrender, you do surrender to the moments. And a lot of it is putting the right people in the room and witnessing and choosing, you know, and, and uh, directing traffic, making sure nobody bumps into the furniture. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's a little bit more than that. But um, I, I don't know if we're at the end, but, but we haven't talked about Messi, about the web series Messi. Oh, okay, yes. So, yeah, I, I, frankly, I'm having a hard time asking questions because I could just listen to you all day. And <laughs> I know people are going to want to ask questions, but please talk about Messi. So that's a completely different thing, being involved in a series. So tell yeah. us about so um, uh, I was really fortunate uh, to uh, to be able to direct this web series called Messi, and um, we are about to to launch it. We are, you know, the baby is uh, is finally ready to be pushed out. Um, we were you know, trying to sell it, but you know, without it's it, 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 it's tricky. Anyway, um, th that was really fun. And originally I was asked to be in it uh, in one of the episodes by the creator, Kate Warren, who wrote it, who plays the lead. Um, mm. And we had a reading with all the actors. And um, I could just see during the reading, everything became alive for me. I could see the whole thing visually in front of my eyes. And I kept thinking to myself, I want to direct this. And this happened to me before um, when I was asked to be in something. And I, uh, Tim McHenry from the Rubin Museum asked me if I would direct um, uh, the Dhammapada, which is the Buddhist uh, scriptures. It was a, like a stage reading with Elm Burstein and my husband. And he asked me to be in it and uh, Linus Roach and, uh, um, and Michelle Beck. And I said, I would like to direct it. And it came out of left field. And this was the same, but I didn't say anything because I thought it was ludicrous. And the next day, Kate called me because she must have heard me ne sitting next to her laughing. I mean, like, like laughing my eyes out. It was, it is so funny and so excruciating and painful sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, uh, she said, would you like to direct it? And I went, wow, <laughs> yes. Absolutely. She said, I, I just kept looking at you and I could see that you could see what I, I wrote. And, you know, that's it. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to share that uh, with the world. Nice. So when are you going to launch that so that everyone can see it? Very soon. Very <laughs> soon. Very soon. Like it will, I, I will definitely announce it on, on social media. And, and yeah. You know, it, it's it's very different because although it was something that I completely 100% related to and identified with, I realized this is not a character I've seen on mm -hmm. screen. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. Great. That's yeah. great. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And yet she's all of us, you know? <laughs> yes. She's yes. messy, but she's all of so, us. Some, some of us in the future. <laughs> on here <laughs> well, um i want to open it up to questions so i always ask if you want to ask a question please physically you know raise your hand so i can see you um and um gosh i really could listen to you all day it's just so amazing that you've you've kept all of your you know very serious theater roots going at the same time as the independent film so it's just just fabulous so who has a question for nicole it's now or never. <laughs> I um, sadly wasn't able to share this. I wanted to share this as a watch party on, on Facebook, but I, I realized because I'm on the computer, oh, I should have done it on my phone. Oh, yeah. yes, yes, yes. I, I just technologically speaking could not figure that out at all. Does anybody have a question for Nicole? Kevin, go ahead. Hi, Nicole. Uh, Kevin Fontuti here. Um, I'm a first-time feature film director, and I just 
super inspired by your stories about that kind of going from the first one to deciding if you want to do the second one and how. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I was wondering, do you see yourself doing more television or more film in the future? Is there something that, you know, both from a, a director and from an actor standpoint? And I do have to say that in this in this age and time, television is really exciting. The, 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 the writing is so smart. And what I love, and I think, you know, the pandemic certainly helped us be able to binge more, is like we, we uh, or me, I've become greedy. I want to see more. Even though I don't have the time, my eyes are falling asleep, but I still want to watch more. I, I want to follow characters on a longer trajectory. But the first love is, of course, always um, feature film because there is an art form in creating the arc that, you know, has to be completed in 90 minutes or a little less or a little more. Um, there, there is an art form in that. So it is, in, in a way, uh, it, it is a discipline that I find absolutely fascinating. And I am working on a feature film that I'm writing and that I want to direct. And by the way, the, the, the play that I'm directing is multimedia. So I'm also creating a short film that is more like a poem um, uh, with it. Um, you know, uh, Kevin, what can I say? Whatever comes to me, if it feels right, will be where I will be and where I will go. If I'm inspired, um, that's where I will go. But, um, I've lived long enough that I no longer do things if I'm not inspired or if I don't like the people. You know, I have to like the people because my life is too precious. <laughs> Thank you so much. I that's fantastic. Thank you. Congratulations and good luck. Thank Break you. a leg. <laughs> Alejandra, Alejandra, you're next or Alexandra. How do you say your name? Uh, it's Alexandra. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, thank you, Nicole. It was really interesting learning all like from your professional journey and everything from acting to directing to producing. You've done it all. <laughs> You've done it all there. So, well, I'm I'm from I'm based in Honduras in Central America. And right now we have uh, I've, like it does the film industry. It's just starting out so it's literally we're we are in barren barren country literally <laughs> we're we're just planting planting the seeds so what would you recommend for us as independent filmmakers that are looking to do the breakthrough like considering all the things that you mentioned like for the distribution and for being considered for awards and stuff because i mean we we were involved with my husband. My husband is a, it's an animator and a director as well. Mm -hmm. And I am mostly in the production side. And we were recently involved in the post-production for a feature, but, and we were trying to help them. I mean, help the team because they didn't really have like a distribution plan. Alexandra, I'm just going to cut you short because a lot of people want to ask oh. a question. So oh, yeah. um, the, the question basically was, how do we start? Yeah, how, how right. what would you recommend us like for our industry that is blooming, right? Uh, what would you recommend us to do? Well, um, a, a friend of mine we came should. to mind, um, uh, um, uh, Maristela Avila is her name. She is from Colombia. And uh, during the pandemic, she was back in Colombia. Um, she was in New York, now she's in Germany. And um, she witnessed something, um, so I don't know if you're doing feature or documentary, but she witnessed something happening out her window, how a homeless person was being uh, treated really badly by, by the police. And she took her um, iPhone and started filming it. And then she went downstairs, she met uh, the, the, the homeless man um, and, and started to interview him. And um, then she, like every time she saw it, because it would happen daily, um, the police just was bored, I guess. Um, 
and it became a short documentary and she has sent it to festivals and she already won best award at, uh, at a festival. It cost her nothing. Um, it was her integrity and her concern for humanity that, that drew her to, um, uh, to, to, to make this film, which I think is absolutely incredible. Um, so if you have an iPhone, start <laughs> doing it on an iPhone, you know, well, if you can I, invest. I uh -huh. You know, last week, actually, I, well, Alexandra, I, I actually, I actually, Alexandra, if you don't mind, I'm going to let the next person ask a yeah, question. Yeah, sure. No problem. <laughs> well, put it in the chat, Alexandra. Yeah, yeah sure. thank you so much for coming, calling in all the way from Honduras. We have someone from Honduras, someone from Trinidad today. So I love that. So cool. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Rolf, you're next. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Actually, I can't think of a question, but I'm really impressed by your career. It's a fascinating <laughs> story. I'm just really enjoying it. And yeah, just awesome. Uh, okay. I guess the maybe one question would be, where do you see yourself headed in the future, your long-term goals and aspirations, perhaps? You know, as an actor, because I've been an actor and always wanted to be an actor, and that is kind of my second skin, I really would like to win an award for Best Actress, like a big, juicy award, you know, um, juicy. obviously the Oscars, you know, but but mm. if it's a, a Golden Bear or... Uh, um, or César, I wouldn't say no either. Um, that is something for my vanity. Um, and, um, you know, as, as a filmmaker, I, uh, I want to continue making movies as an actor and as a director um, that, um, that move people and that contribute um, in some way to humanity in a way that uh, questions uplifts um, and and reflects back um, to to us who we are and how we can be better. I'm also um, uh, a um, I'm, I'm also um, how do you call it like a you know I'm I'm right now being trained as a climate leader. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so the future of the earth is is very important to me. Nice, thank you. Uh, Miranda. Ah, bonjour, je m'appelle Miranda. Oui, bonjour, hey. Miranda, comment ça va? Uh, ça va très bien. Enchanté. Oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to just get that in because I, when you said you were speaking French, I was like, ooh, my French is not that great, but I'm going to try. <laughs> um, I, I am an actress um, and a first-time feature film writer and director. Um, and I have just been so inspired by this. So thank you so much for speaking today. And Rolf actually uh, took my question. So I'm going to try to piggyback off of right. his. No, it's okay. Thank you for asking it. I love your answer, Nicole, for my vanity. I single here. <laughs> I get it. Um, but I wanted to find out in my group, my writers group, where when we're working with um, material, we are always inspired to ask what our characters are hoping for and what they are afraid of. So I wanted to sort of, if it's not too prying to ask either you with your work specifically or just the direction you see filmmaking going, what do you think we should be hoping for and what do you think we should be afraid of or is there anything? That's my question. Climate change. I mean, what, like, films will no longer be in existence if the earth is not in existence. So I think um, one of the important things, and, and, and it doesn't have to be movies about climate change, but why not um, see in movies characters drive electric cars, you know, and, and, and just do things differently and, and, chop their own vegetables and you know like tend to their own garden without mm -hmm. necessarily making it about that but incorporating a better way of living and of of of, of coexisting and 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 being a part of mother earth um mm -hmm. uh, rather than than pillaging and 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 thinking you know it it doesn't really matter like one of the things that I've noticed with myself and I have two teenagers is they do takeout all the time because it's easier. And I go, yeah, I'm working, so that's good. 
I realized how much recycling is, is that is and how much plastic goes to waste. And yeah, um, I, I think like raising consciousness in ways that don't necessarily have to be the story, but just being part of the story mm -hmm. of, um, of that. I think um, that's what I'm hoping for. Wow. I would never have thought of that, Nicole. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Miranda. Thank you. And Nate, where, where are you calling from today? You need to unmute, Nate. Hi, I'm calling from Atlanta. And I just like to say thank you so much, Joanne, for, um, for this platform. It's my first time and it is, has been so wonderful. Um, thank you, Nicole, for your story. I'll be quick. Um, <clears throat> I've just produced my uh, very first, well, I produced, directed, and created my very first film promo, um, and so I'm really excited and am eager to learn. I'm new to the industry, um, coming over from owning a dance company and doing um, dance oh. plays, and so um, I'd like to know what um, is your advice on, well, what have you found most um, helpful in your uh, raising of funds for your um, projects? And also with that, um, in regards to investors, um, what are your greatest pros and cons with having investors involved? That was such a great question, Nate. Nicole. Mm, that's a good <laughs> question. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not the expert in that, but I would say approaching people for um, money, there are many ways. There are, of course, a lot of grants, uh, art grants, and et cetera, you can apply, uh, like film grants that you can apply to um, if you have the time. Um, and if you have somebody who knows how to write these things out, I'm not good with that. I'm good talking with people. So networking, talking to people, telling them, uh, you know, what literally the way that I've raised money is just like opening my mouth and what are you working on? This is what I'm working on. Yeah, I'm still raising the money. I need this kind of money. And, you know, I've had people go, I'll give you something and it's a gift or, you know, so uh, with investors, um, I, I so far have had um, bad experiences, as I mentioned, you know, people running away with money and um, also um, uh, like, for example, some of the South, like there was, there was money from China that we weren't able to get out or they weren't able to get out, you know? Um, so if you have investors, for example, um, if, if I'm, I'm not gonna mention which one, but but there was a chance we, we, we were getting a ton of money from Israel, uh, but it was clear that the person had to do with weapon export. And um, I said, I'm out. If I, I will not take money from that. So um, know where the money comes from and, um, and don't give away your, um, your gem. So when, when, when investors come with a lot of money, they, they want something. Uh, of course, for it. So make sure that you're not uh, selling your soul to the devil, so to speak. Yeah, yeah make sure that what it is that they want matches up with what you want. Um, because yeah, yeah, that's, uh, thank you, Nate. That was an awesome question. Um, I'm going to put, bring this to a close. And really, Nicole, I could just have listened to you all day. You're such a fantastic. I could talk to you all day. <laughs> So, You're so such exciting. a fantastic storyteller, and those are some great stories. So you know, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I really, really appreciate you spending some time with us today, and uh, it's great to get to know more about about your work. So we look forward to seeing Messi. We're all gonna run out and watch Son of the South. <laughs> and uh, yes, yes, please. Yes, yes. And and Remember Me is another film that uh, my whole family is in, actually. <laughs> it seems um, as though you like to work together uh, with your husband uh, often. We and, do. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great, too. That's wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for calling in from all over the world. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Break a leg. Bye. Break a leg. <laughs> bye. Cheers.